city councilor, which is how I met our special guest, our congressman, but we'll get to that. And if you were thinking, wow, she is a masochist for being the ED of a nonprofit uh, and also a city councilor <laughs> and a mom of three boys, you are right. You are right. Um, but I truly feel privileged to be able to do this work. And especially for our purposes tonight, uh, being a local official, I think does give me some insights into how hard your work is at the local level and why it's so important for CRWA to support you in any way that we can. So the other presenters we have tonight are Julie Wood, CRWA's deputy director who runs all of our science programs and a lot more. And Robert Kearns, our climate resilience specialist who heads up our climate resilience outreach to cities and towns. We also have hiding behind the CRWA Zoom account, our communications manager, Travis Morin, um, who will help if there's any sort of uh, technical issues, which of course, after a year of doing Zoom, there won't be. Uh, but just in case, please do use the chat box or email charles at crwa.org and Travis is checking that account. If this were normal times, uh, we would do a round of introductions, but since it's not normal times and we are on Zoom, uh, and we wanna keep this to an hour, which is really as long as any Zoom event should be, I'll ask that you please share in the chat your name, your title or affiliation and your city or town. Um, and also if you have any questions or comments along the way, please use the chat box. Uh, so for, for our agenda tonight, um, we are going to start with a few remarks from our Congressman. Then we will talk briefly about some of the climate impacts we are already seeing in our watershed and some very specific ideas of about what we can do about that. And also how we can fund those solutions because I know as a city councilor myself, funding is always an issue for local communities. And then we will open it up to Q and A and that is my favorite part because then we get to hear from you. Um, so with that, I would like to introduce our Congressman, Jake Auchincloss. I first met Representative Auchincloss when he ran for city councilor in Newton in 2015. And I had the pleasure of serving with him for the next five years until he was elected to Congress last year. Uh, the representative was always a staunch supporter and champion of all things green and environmental. And so I am delighted to be able to continue to work with him on those issues in his new role. And with that, I will turn it over to Representative Auchincloss. Emily, I appreciate the invitation and the introduction. Uh, and as you said, I'm really looking forward to being able to work with you going forward on environmental issues at this next stage uh, beyond the Newton City Council. Uh, and the CRWA has a fierce advocate in Emily Norton. I will tell you, after five years of, of politics with her, I can tell you that there is no better operator, no better advocate for an issue that she cares passionately about than Emily Norton, and she cares passionately about water and the environment. So I have no doubt that she is, uh, is serving you extremely well in Massachusetts and nationally. Um, this is a really, really important issue for me. The headwaters of the Charles River in my district in Hopkinton and the vast majority of the towns in the Massachusetts Fourth uh, are affected by the watershed. The health of the Charles River and our water potability and our resilience as a district are top of mind for me and for my staff. And indeed, we have recently met with both the American and Massachusetts Water Works Associations to hear from them about their priorities, in addition to talking with state and local officials throughout the district uh, about their infrastructure needs. Uh, as a city councilor, I saw up close that local officials, both in the executive and the legislative branches are on the front lines of planning for resilience and sustainability. When we did our sustainability assessment as a city in Newton, we saw what I know many of you are seeing as you do your assessments, that rain, heat, wind, drought are going to be uh, the kinds of extreme weather events that you need to plan for uh, without necessarily the funding to do so. And that increasingly your constituents are having higher expectations for the carbon out, the carbon footprint, excuse me, of your municipalities and are asking deeper questions about the potability and long-term health of their water supply. These are all good things, uh, but they do increase the stakes for you and they underline the importance of support at both the state and federal level. The good news is that I believe strongly we are entering a period of renewed interest and investment in the health of our waterways and our drinking water as a country. We have seen 
already in the American Rescue Plan and the funds that are being dispersed to cities and towns uh, over the next 30 to 60 days, and then again a year from now, that those funds, although designated to help relieve uh, and, and provide disaster relief for the pandemic, were specifically authorized to be spent on water sewer infrastructure if necessary. So the funds that your cities and towns are getting can be used for water infrastructure that's statutorily approved because Congress recognizes how important it is. And the money that the counties have gotten, Norfolk and Bristol County in particular, also can be used for water or sewer infrastructure. So the federal government has already made a significant investment in our water infrastructure. And really the work has yet to begin. Last night, I was at the president's address to the joint session of Congress. And I heard our president make climate change, make clean energy, and make resilience a pillar of his American Jobs and Families Plan. The American Jobs Plan is going to provide more than $100 billion for water infrastructure over the next eight years. It's going to be critically important for Massachusetts. Over the last 10 years, we've had 14 extreme weather events that have cost us $5 billion. And over the next 20 years, we're expecting to see more than $12 billion in need for our water infrastructure. So these funds are coming on a moment too soon, and they're gonna allow us to ensure the potability of our water supply for our constituents, as well as the health of our natural resources and the health of the Charles River watershed. Additionally, in the shorter term, uh, both Catherine Clark and I are working on water projects through the, our prerogative of member-directed spending, what used to be called earmarks, but we are working closely with the cities and towns throughout our respective districts to prioritize their water needs. I know Representative Clark uh, made the Charles River Watershed Association's uh, flood planning a priority for her, and uh, we obviously supported that measure. And my team and I have worked with uh, more than 10 towns throughout my district to prioritize their water projects for federal support. As I do roundtables around my district, I hear about water infrastructure, I hear about housing, and I hear about mental health for students. These are three top of mind issues for constituents north and south of my district. So while the work ahead of us is going to be long, it's gonna require significant federal, state, and local cooperation. It's gonna require leadership like what Charles River Watershed Association provides. We have the support of our constituents to do this work, and it's increasingly salient for uh, the people that we serve. Fabulous. Thank you so much, Congressman. Those words were, um, were just what we needed to hear, especially the lovely words about me. So anytime. Um, I, I really do appreciate that. I'm um, Seriously, thank you so much. You've been a wonderful partner. You mentioned the funding, and we look forward to seeing the results of that and continuing a, a partnership with you um, because uh, you get what it's like, uh, what the challenges are at the local level. So we'd welcome you to stick around, but we know that you have a lot going on. So we will not, we will not take it personally if you have to move on to the next thing, but uh, you certainly are welcome to stay. And with that, let's um, move along, Robert. Great, so just some brief background for folks, um, for the, those who may not be super familiar with our history, though I expect many of you are. We were founded in 1965 by a group of local people who were upset about the state of the Charles River. And particularly at that time, being told that nope, nothing can be done. The river, the, I mean, this was written in reports that from South Natick to Boston can never be cleaned up again. And they did not accept that. And it was a lot of hard work, and that's a whole wonderful story and another webinar for another time, the true story of the cleanup of the Charles. Um, but we still work to, um, to, con to continue uh, the cleanup efforts, which are not at all um, uh, completed, particularly with climate change increasing the risks in many areas. So we have an interdisciplinary staff using science advocacy and the law when necessary um, to continue this, this advocacy. And with that, I'm going to turn this section over to Julie. Thanks, Emily. Um, great to see so many of you here tonight. Um, and it's um, a lot of familiar faces um, and a lot of new faces. So thank you all for joining us. 
Um, just a quick jumping in to talk about the what, what is a watershed um, and why is it so important that we work at the watershed scale? Um, many of you on the call might not think you have connections to one another, but um, for the vast majority of you, your communities are part of our watershed. So this is basically the Charles River River Basin, the land around the, char the, land around the river that drains into the river. And we'll be talking a lot about what happens when that land drains into the river. Um, it's kind of appropriate that it's a rainy night um, because we will be talking a lot about what happens when it rains in the, um, in the river and all that runoff goes into our pipes and down into our streams and into the river. Um, so just a brief overview of the Charles. Um, hopefully most of you can find where you are in the watershed. Hopefully you knew that before you logged on, but if you didn't, um, here's your little cheat sheet. So um, as the Congressman already mentioned, the headwaters of the river is in Hopkinton. It runs 80 miles from Hopkinton to Boston, a much more sinuous route than the marathon, um, which also goes Hopkinton to Boston in 26.2 miles. Um, the land area though is 308 square miles, uh, made up of 35 cities and towns, um, 23 of those directly abutting the river. So as you all know, much environmental decision-making is made at the local level. So you folks that represent or live in or come from or work for those 35 cities and towns are really key partners for us. Um, and so that's why we're um, engaging you tonight. Uh, and many of you have been working with us for a long time, um, but you really have a lot of power to make change at the local level. And if we do that all across the watershed at 35 cities and towns, um, the impact is felt all across the river. And it really does take that watershed approach to have a substantive change at the watershed scale. I think I'm handing it back to you, Emily. Yes, oh. thank you, Julie. So we did promise interactive, or if we didn't, it will be interactive. We're gonna do a poll. So a couple questions for you. How often do your constituents or the residents that you deal with uh, raise climate related issues to you? And how familiar are you with the Massachusetts Small Municipal Separate Storm Sewer System or MS4 general permit? Seeing some answers come in. All right, 17 of 21 have voted, 80% turnout. It's pretty good. I bet the Congressman would agree with me on that. Pretty good, pretty good uh, voter uh, participation. So how often do your constituents raise climate related issues? 29% say occasionally, 47% say often, and 24% say always. So you're hearing from people. No one said never. You are hearing from people about these issues. How familiar are you with the MS4 permit? 18% say very, let's see, do I? Oh, here we go. 41% um, say somewhat and 41% say not at all. Not to say told you so, Julie, but when I started in this job, people at CRW are pretty smart, a lot of super sciencey people. And when I started in the position two and a half years ago, I was like, I don't think local people even know about this mandate. Yeah, it's a mandate. And the staff are like, oh yes, they all know. They're all so familiar. And I was like, I don't think you understand the world of local officials. There's a lot coming in and it's hard to follow everything. So, well, this is good. You are going to hear more about it tonight. So in terms of the, I have to close this out here. Uh, the communities represented here tonight, I won't read them all, but we have a good representation from across the watershed. And money, money, money. I know that always gets people's attention. So I wanna say, we get it. We get that money is an issue. And we also get that there's a lot of money out there. And we have already, as you heard, been in touch with um, both of the Congress folks who represent, um, largely represent the district as well as the county commissioner. I didn't even know that there was a county commissioner, but once I heard that he had some money also, we reached out to them. So there's federal money. There is going to be more federal money coming. 
and we will definitely be working to help you access that funding for this type of work, for the climate resilience uh, work that we're going to be talking about tonight. And there are a lot of other forms of funding, and many of them you may be familiar with already, and I won't go through all of these, but we partner with cities and towns all the time on mass DEP grants and so national grants. The MVP grants have been a big um, hallmark of the Baker administration uh, to their credit. And um, they're, and you're, you're going to get these slides afterwards, so you'll, you'll see all of this. I think there's even more. Yep, the CPA funds, if I think most of our communities um, have uh, have joined that program, but if not, that is an opportunity for more funding. Um, and then sometimes there are matches related uh, to these grants, but it doesn't have to even be funding from a city or town. It can be the time that your staff are already spending can serve as the match. So these are all things that we are familiar with, all sources of funding that we're familiar with that we help cities and towns access. So defining our terms tonight, um, just to break it down, this could be a whole webinar on its own, but to break it down in one slide, when people talk about climate change and climate action, there's sort of two sides of the coin, mitigation or uh, reducing the fossil fuel burning that largely is the cause of climate change and adaptation um, or, uh, or how do we deal with the climate change effects that are already here. Even if we stopped burning fossil fuels tomorrow, we're gonna have the storms, the heat, um, the, the drought and so forth. And so how do we, how do we handle that? And then there's this nice nexus where certain actions that we take, such as um, planting trees, help with the mitigation side by sequestering carbon, and then also help on the adaptation side by trapping water and so forth. Um, so most of our work does deal um, with the climate resilience side, but, um, but just wanted to, to make those, those terms clear, what we mean by them tonight. And then I won't go on and on. You know that climate change is really, you know how scary it is. I just like to have one, uh, one slide to show the, the urgency. So for the vast majority of human existence, um, the uh, carbon dioxide levels have been about uh, 250 parts per million. And then as you can see, literally since 1950, it has skyrocketed. The last time carbon dioxide levels were at the level that they are now, sea level rise was 50 to 80 feet higher. It was way, way before Homo sapiens walked the planet. So the issues are urgent and local officials are right at the crux of it. And that's, that's why we're here tonight. So just to give you some examples, I'm sure you don't need these reminders, but it's nice to have them. This, um, it's cool, one of these days we'll, we'll have the video running of this. This was a dumpster that was dislodged on Congress Street in Boston during the, those extreme storms in January 2018. And this really got people's attention because it was a dumpster that got dislodged and was floating down Congress Street. And this is the muddy river floating in Brookline in 2010 during those extreme storms. There's Franklin, Populatic Street in Franklin. There's Hopedale, some uh, storm effects uh, there just last year. Got Wayland, Wayland is in the house or here, uh, Wayland is in the boat um, from some extreme um, flooding in the Charles and the Sudbury. And I think at this point, I turn it over to Robert. Awesome, thank you so much, Emily. When we look at the watershed in the Commonwealth, we see many of the municipal names derived from water as a nod to the geography of the area. We have a history of brooks, streams, bays, and waterways that were once open and ultimately were filled, channelized, and buried. You can see the drawing here of Boston, and you can see the Back Bay and the streams of the South Bay, which have obviously been filled and altered over time. And we're also looking here at the Charles River Basin, which originally was tidal flats, and obviously doesn't look like that anymore. There's a lot more development. We've dammed the Charles River, so we have that um, Ch lower Charles River Basin. Everybody loves to enjoy that freshwater basin, and a lot more roadways, parking lots, and impervious services have come about going back into history. We're going to move on to another area. Many of us, are, like I said, are familiar with downtown Boston, but this story really carries on across our watershed. Now we're looking at the upper watershed community of Medfield in 1852 on the left um, versus today on the right. And we're gonna be zooming into that red area, which is around Medfield's North Brook. And as you can see on the left, North Brook 
way back in 1852, didn't have much development around it. It was really meandering. And today it's, you know, been significantly altered, obviously, over time. And I'm going to show you, if you couldn't really see, that's the approximate location of the brook um, today. And that really highlights the differences that have happened over time. And also another area of Medfield we're going to look at right now really quickly is um, around Nantasket Brook around the south and central part of Medfield. I'm going to be zooming into this area. And if you look at Nantasket Brook on the left, there is sparse development and um, really not much development along the uh, confluence with the Stop River. And today there's a little bit a lot more development, but if you look on the right-hand side around the, the Stop River confluence, really much, not as much has changed because of the great work that the town and partners have done to preserve that area of wetlands. Um, and if you couldn't really tell where the streams are, I just highlighted them there. And this, and this carries on um, across the watershed. We're looking at Franklin now in 1832 versus today. We're gonna to be zooming in right into the downtown area of Franklin. Um, same area. So in 1832 on the left, you can see the tributary here to the mine broken downtown. It was all open, it was meandering, all of these little squiggly lines you can see there. And look today, you can see the, the public school and a lot of the neighborhoods that have been developed around there um, and how the brook has changed. Um, I'm just highlighting it there. So just showing you how you know things have changed over the years and, and really what the impact has been. And also we cannot forget you know the history of systemic racism that continues to the day. Um, and the photo on the left shows a map of redlining in Waltham, Massachusetts. Um, and you can see the red line areas highlighted in red circles there where people were actively denied loans for banks and where resources like infrastructure were not prioritized historically. Um, and this builds upon the great work of Brownworks USA and the University of Richmond who digitized these maps all, all across America. And it shows how the roots of environmental injustice come from systemic racism. And no surprise, these same areas on the right um, today are state designated environmental justice communities in minority in yellow and uh, minority in income in green. And they have a higher percentage of toxic facilities are a higher risk of flooding from things like the Moody Street Dam, dam there in downtown um, Waltham. And this, this uh, history of environmental injustice continues across the watershed. This is actually downstream of the Moody Street Dam and we're looking at um, Alston, um, Cambridge and Watertown here. And you can see that the same areas are still today state designated environmental justice communities near Interstate 90. Um, and they have the same issues of flooding and higher concentration of pollutions from the highway. And the third example we have is of the, uh, Newton Upper Falls, which is still today, was, was historically redlined, and today is a state designated environmental justice community and is really close to the river and suffers from a higher percentage of black top and, and therefore urban flooding. So now that we have some sort of context of the history of, of what has happened um, in your communities, um, we're going to be moving on to what happens today. So likely recently or your, um, your community has gone through the MVP or municipal vulnerability preparedness process that Emily talked about earlier. And in that process, you all have worked on a community resilience building workshop to build out your, your MVP plan. And this planning process likely um, built upon your established FEMA hazard mitigation plan, which is important as maintaining the status of these plans, ensure that your community is still eligible for future MVP action grants. And the picture on um, here is of the uh, Community Resilience Building Workshop in Waltham. And what the process has done, you probably know about this, but if you didn't, it identified where vulnerabilities where vulnerable communities are in your community. And as you can see, they're listed on the slides. Um, additionally, um, vulnerable, vulnerable communities include environmental justice communities, which are state designated census tracts like the maps I showed earlier. And those include 
populations of minority income and English isolation or a combination of the three. And the most important part of the report, um, of the MVP report are the top hazards and priority actions identified by the community. Um, likely these included, like the Congressman has stated, severe weather, extreme temperatures and flooding and com communities um, across the watershed have had different priority actions like moving a defunct mill dam, which Rentham was looking into installing green stormwater infrastructure that Milford has been doing and a lot of other communities have done, as well as improving your emergency response plans. And now I'm gonna hand it off to Julie to talk about stormwater and um, the impacts that it's having on communities. Excellent, thank you so much, Robert. Um, great, I lo love those maps. That was, that was a great, um, great demonstration there. So stormwater runoff is an easy one to describe tonight. If you don't know what it is, um, after we get off the Zoom, just go out and get a little fresh air uh, because stormwater runoff is just that rainwater runoff that you're gonna see uh, running down the street, running down your driveway, um, even running over your lawn sometimes, depending on how, how hard it's raining. Um, so for those of us in the Charles River watershed, as I mentioned, all that water will end up in the Charles River um, because we are in that Charles River drainage basin. Uh, so the problem comes in when we change the way that the natural landscape works. Um, we add things to it like chemicals and other pollutants um, and we change the natural land cover. So this totally changes our natural water cycle. And of course that has impacts on the river. So every drop of rain that's falling tonight and running over that pavement is likely carrying something down to the river. Um, bacteria, pollutants, you can see this nice image, um, dog waste, um, anything that comes off our cars, tire waste, even car exhaust, um, and anything we put on our lawns. Um, so stormwater runoff for most developed areas, really the vast majority of water bodies all across the country, stormwater runoff is the largest source of pollution. Um, and that is absolutely true in the Charles. Next slide. We see more stormwater runoff when we have more impervious cover, paved services, um, blacktop as Robert called it. Um, that can be driveways, roadways, parking lots, buildings, even buildings. Um, in a natural forested system, the ground cover is porous or permeable and the, the rainwater that falls can go into the ground, um, get filtered through plants and soils and recharge groundwater. It can go into the ground and get stored there. However, in our developed areas, it can't get through these hard services. So this table here, and I apologize because the text is a little small, but this table here, or excuse me, this graph shows impervious acre percentage by community all across the watershed. Um, so if you remember, all of these communities are draining to the Charles River. Um, we have a pretty wide array um, with Sherburn being quite low um, and in fact, one of the lowest in the state um, and Somerville being quite high, um, I think possibly actually the highest in the state. Um, and I know we have someone from Somerville on the call because she is my ward counselor. <laughs> um, and so you see the, you see the uh, span here. Um, however, really once you get over even 5% impervious cover for a watershed, you're going to see impacts on your water quality and you're likely going to see potential fl flooding impacts. So even though those communities are down to the left of the graph are very, very low, that impervious cover is still likely causing issues with the natural waterways. Next slide. So in addition to pollution, we also worry about flooding. Um, and of course, as Emily mentioned, with the impacts of climate change, flooding is one of the things we are most worried about here in the Northeast. We are expecting that our rain events will get more intense, but fewer and further between. So we're gonna have extended dry periods followed by extreme rain events um, and seeing storms the size of which we've never seen before. Obviously, this, there's examples of this um, in other parts of the country. Um, Houston, not too long ago, really um, blasted by intense rain events. 
Emily showed some of those images of what we experienced back in March of 2020, March of 2010, which is one of our most extreme rain months on record. So the image there on the left shows the impervious surfaces. Um, which there are a lot across the watershed, a very developed area. Um, the image on the right comes from an analysis that um, NASA actually did for us last fall, um, looking at using um, some readily available data to determine areas that are susceptible to flooding. Um, so if you see that key on the lower right of the sl slide, um, the left side in blue shows low to high what's susceptible to flooding, um, and that's pretty much almost the entire watershed. Um, so there are some high areas, but um, a lot of the watershed is susceptible to flooding. And then the um, x-axis shows flood vulnerability. Um, so that is presence of vulnerable populations um, pulled from those environmental justice maps that Robert um, showed earlier some zoom ins on those, um, because as we know, it is typically um, the most vulnerable among us, um, including low income residents that have the most difficult time recovering from the disruptions that we know are coming from climate change. Um, and flooding is a key one of those. Um, so whether it's flooding in your own home, whether it's flooding of the transit system, um, those will those disruptions are coming. Um, and there are those that are more vulnerable um, and less have less of an ability to weather those changes. So this map kind of overlays those two, or this color map kind of overlays those two. Where do we see flooding and where do we see potentially vulnerable communities? Thanks. Next slide, Robert. Um, so more than half of you did say you were familiar with the MS4 permit. So I obviously will claim to Emily that I am right about that. <laughs> and even a few of you said you're very familiar with the MS4 permit. Uh, that the, <laughs> those are probably those among you that I talk to more on a more regular basis. Um, the MS4 permit is a major regulatory driver in, for the Charles River watershed um, and for really waters all across um, you know, Massachusetts and the country for that matter, um, because this is a permit that regulates stormwater, which as I mentioned, is really the biggest issue that um, our natural systems face. Um, so this is an EPA issued permit here in Massachusetts and other states it's issued by the state. It's issued directly from EPA here. Um, and it requires municipalities to do some um, general good housekeeping practices for stormwater management. There are, however, specific um, requirements for those of us in Charles River municipalities. Um, and those come from a study that was done some years ago, um, a pollution budget study for nutrient pollutions, which identified that we have about twice as much nutrient pollution going into the Charles as we should have, as we would have if it were a natural undeveloped system. Um, so that's a problem. So those nutrients are getting in there and really over fertilizing the river and we get things like these cyanobacteria blooms which are shown in the picture. Um, they come in the summer and can last all summer. Um, they can be very harmful to dogs um, as well as other animals and they can impact recreation. So twice as much is too much and most of that is coming from stormwater runoff getting carried there by stormwater runoff. So the MS4 permit is key in controlling that. And it does have specific requirements for each community to reduce their phosphorus runoff or their nutrient pollution um, by a certain amount. Um, so that may be something folks, if you're not aware of, you may be hearing about soon um, because that will require some investment at the community level. Um, however, if you go to the next slide, um, that investment can, can have a lot of co-benefits for your community. So at Charles River Watershed Association, we really push our partners, our municipal partners, our private industry partners um, to explore nature-based solutions. Um, and we're working with a group of communities right now to actually test out some nature-based solutions at the watershed scale and see how well they might um, help us adapt to flooding. These are systems that use natural processes, whether it's soil or plants, um, to treat and manage stormwater. 
So as you, inv as you make those changes that the MS4 permit requires you to make, um, just remember that you are also investing in renaturalizing your landscape when you're using nature-based solutions. Um, and you are likely also going to help mitigate the impacts of climate change. Um, so nature-based solutions, in addition to helping with water pollution, can have a lot of benefits for flood control, as I mentioned. Um, and they can also have a lot of benefits for urban heat island impacts. Um, if you add more greenery to the landscape, that is going to reduce um, that heat burden that we see from vast, um, expansive, impervious areas. Uh, next slide. So one local example of a nature-based solution um, that predates my time at uh, Charles River Watershed Association is the Natural Valley Storage Area. Um, predates, predates many of us on this call, I would guess. Um, so our local area um, in 1955 was hit by two really extreme hurricanes, Hurricane Connie and Hurricane Diane. Um, and a lot of drastic flooding impacts, obviously those um, photos begin to demonstrate it. So after that, those two extreme events, um, the Army Corps was searching for opportunities to make the Charles River system more flood resilient. Um, and some of you may be a little bit familiar with the Army Corps and know that a lot of times what they'll do is build canals or channelize rivers or build levees, build dams, um, very much what we would call hardscape or gray interventions. Um, are, are typically what they have in their toolbox. However, this was a unique case in the then director of Charles River Watershed Association, a woman named Rita Barron, actually advocated that instead of investing in these hardscapes, they work to conserve some of the natural wetlands that were existing, conserve and preserve these natural wetland systems that were all across the watershed, or excuse me, all across the watershed. Um, so she was successful, and that is the origin story for the Natural Valley Storage Area. Um, instead, of, instead of building all these crazy levees and canals, they just went ahead and protected 8,100 acres of natural wetlands. Wetlands act like a sponge. They can hold that water. They're adjustable. They can adapt to drought. They can adapt to flood, and they can store flood water in the upper and middle watershed give the river time to drain and make it so you reduce that flash flooding that comes when you get a whole bunch of rain all at once. Um, so the Army Corps spent $8.3 million. This took from 1977 to 1983. Um, there's a bunch of different sites and they're, they're, it's not one contigu contiguous wetland. It's a bunch of different small wetland sites that were preserved. Um, so they actually are in part of 16 different communities all across the watershed. So you have area if you're in any of those communities, if you're in any of downstream communities, you are protected by this area. Um, and today they're also you know, beautiful recreational opportunities. So this is a great example of nature-based solution that helps protect the river from both flooding and pollution. Another quick example, um, the stream you see in the photo on the left, Cheesecake Brook. Um, this is an example, one of, one of, could fit in with Robert's previous examples. Um, the brook was completely channelized, straightened, um, armored on both sides, which means it has stone walls on both sides. Nothing you would ever find in nature. This is, this is not a natural looking system at all. Um, it runs through a park, which is nice, but you can see that, um, they are also just mowing the grass right down to the banks of the river. No, no buffer vegetation, no, no nothing. Um, so we worked with some residents. This is in Newton. We worked with some residents in the local area to do a visioning process to think about how we might make this a little bit more natural. And at the same time, also increase some flood benefits um, by providing a bit more storage, providing a natural floodplain, a space where the river can overtop and you can store water until um, there's room downstream for it to flow. So I think the next photo is a nice rendering of that. Um, so you can see adding some meanders, um, adding a natural floodplain, adding some more natural vegetation, 
um, and essentially making a little bit more room for that river, which is very flashy. It drains a very, um, a very urbanized watershed. Next slide. Um, another example, this, e these are some photos, uh, well, a, a photo and a rendering of some green infrastructure systems that we are currently finalizing design for to be built at the Milford Town Park. This is also funded by an MVP grant, um, which I think we have an MVP staffer on the call tonight too. So thank you, MVP. Um, this is a rain garden. Uh, this is one of the rain gardens. We're actually putting in two rain gardens and then one underground infiltration system. So that um, sort of crazy looking picture on your left that is showing a system that will be all underground. People will not even know it's there, but it will collect rainwater and allow it, store it and allow it to seep back down into the ground. Um, Milford is a community that relies on local groundwater for their drinking water. Um, so being able to recharge that groundwater um, serves a lot of benefits in that community. Next slide. Oh, I'm handing it back to you, Robert. Thank you so much, Julie. And Julie talked a lot about tangible projects and infrastructure, but that's not the only way we can build climate resilience in our communities. We've created a climate resilience toolkit, which is hosted on our website at crwa.org forward slash toolkit, where we host policy solutions. And one way you can help build climate resilience is through strengthening your local wetlands protection bylaw or if you don't have one, you can, you can adopt one as well. And by doing this, you can protect features like vernal pools, isolated wetlands, and intermittent streams, which are not currently um, covered by the state law. And additionally, it can, you can include climate change as a reason for wetland protection. And that is uh, strengthening your local protections, strong, making it stronger than the state law. Uh, and, and by doing that, you, the, the Conservation Commission, who is the regulatory body who oversees that many of you uh, who are on here are on the conservation commissions. Um, you can consider climate change adaptation um, and strategies for flooding and heat islands when you do your policy decisions. Um, and of the 35 cities and towns in the Charles River watershed, uh, 28 already have a local wetlands bylaw. However, only two of them, Arlington and Boston, mention climate change. So we're really urging folks to check up and update your local wetlands bylaw to consider climate change. Um, and we have examples from Arlington and Boston and more on our website. Additionally, while we do not always recognize trees as such, they are a critical piece of our infrastructure and help us adapt to climate change. Maintaining and improving our community's tree canopies provides so many benefits uh, reduces air pollution, noise pollution, urban heat island effects, lowers energy costs, and improves our water quality. And this robust tree canopy has been identified in a lot of our community's MVP plans as, as a high priority. So we are urging you all to adopt a local tree protection bylaw um, to help protect trees that are being removed by developers or private property owners. Um, Whereas when that happens, our local tree canopies, they, they get reduced and all of those benefits start to wane. Um, and we have resources on the website that um, and examples from Lexington and Somerville and, and, can, and we can work with you to help do protections for your trees. Um, and with the pandemic, there's been a lot of loss of revenues and we understand that climate resilience may not be on the top of mind when you're looking to maintain funds for critical services like schools and fire departments. However, there are opportunities to have dedicated funding sources to do this work to help prepare for climate change. And we recommend if you're not already one of the 24 watershed communities who do not already have the Community Preservation Act um, to work to, to, to pass it in your community through local ballot. Brookline is voting on it next Tuesday. It's, it's yes on question two. And this is a funding mechanism with no more than 3% of the property tax levy, and it can help fund improvements to recreation, affordable housing. I know the Congressman mentioned that's a huge issue, um, as well as open space and historic preservation. And by doing this, you unlock matching state funds as well. Um, 
And not only is there funds dedicated to issues like preservation, you can also do stormwater utility, which is a dedicated funding source um, that can help fund staff as well as infrastructure projects to upgrade your stormwater infrastructure to um, comply with the MS4 permit and prepare for climate change. And you can see we have a list of the 22 communities across the Commonwealth, including my hometown of Braintree, who has a stormwater utility fee. Um, additionally, the toolkit includes information about strengthening your stormwater bylaw to properly um, comply with the MS4 obligation. And we have an example from Northern Middlesex Stormwater Collaborative, and we have information on green streets and other initiatives in the toolkit. And we also have information on reviewing your different plans like your MVP plan and hazard mitigation plan and open space plans. Um, and we're really urging folks to incorporate climate change and coordinate the plans actions um, to strengthen your funding opportunities. Um, and additionally, we also have our conservation tool on the website, which we don't have a lot of time tonight to talk about, but it can help identify areas for protection and for resilience with climate change. If you have any questions, you can feel free to talk to us. Um, you have our emails and we can go into this more detail depending on what your interest is. And this is our second to last poll. Uh, Travis is gonna run it. And the first question is, what is your biggest challenge to implementing climate change adaptation measures in projects? And the second question, do you have regular communication with your upstream and downstream neighbors about climate change adaptation? I'm sharing my screen so I can't see the answers to the poll. So Emily, if you want to narrate how it's coming in, feel yep, free. I, I see the answers coming in. How's it? All right, nine, nine of 15 have voted. 10 of 15, 66%. Not as good as the first, but still. Not as good bit. as the first, but that's okay. It's still, you know, compared to a municipal elections, pretty good turnout. Yes. <laughs> so what is the biggest challenge to implementing climate change adaptation measures and products projects? 70% say funding. Well, we might have covered that tonight and uh, hopefully made clear that we are eager to help with that. One person said lack of public support, so that's too bad. Not sure where to start. No one said that, so that's good. And focusing on mitigation right now. Two people um, said that, which I, I, I totally understand. Unfortunately, we have to do everything because the uh, the effects are here. And but that's that's helpful to know that there's there's definitely interest and willingness, but funding is a challenge. In terms of, do you have regular communication with your upstream and downstream neighbors about climate change adaptation? Three people said yes. Seven said no. And I think that's probably. Um, I'm actually even surprised that three do. That's wonderful. Um, we're very much a strong sort of home rule state. So we have, we stay within our borders. So I'm not surprised that so many people have not had these conversations with their neighbors. But I hope as Julie made clear tonight, it is urgent and critical um, that we do do that because the actions of one do affect, uh, do affect the others. That kind of leads into our Climate Compact, which is a collaborative organization that we founded in 2019 and it brings together communities across the watershed to work on climate change adaptation by sharing information, experiences, and taking a really a regional and watershed view on climate adaptation strategies. And it's a group of municipal officials who are addressing the challenges of lack of information about climate change impacts. And it's an awesome opportunity to coordinate with your neighboring municipalities in the Charles River Water Association on projects. And it, so what, what has the uh, Climate Compact done? One of the major things that they've done is that we have uh, the Watershed Modeling Project, which was an MVP action grant that we received um, to create a computer model to predict where flooding um, is occurring and where future flooding will occur with climate change. And we're gonna be using this to test nature-based solutions like we've talked previously and help the different members of the compact coordinate um, for action grant projects. So if you're not a member, we are encouraging you to join and being a member really helps your community leverage the power of collaboration to further your community resilience work. And Julie, who has been talking earlier in the presentation, runs 
the compact. So if you have any questions, we can connect you to Julie about this as well. And with that, we're gonna do the final poll. Um, and that is what would you be, so what would, bleh, would you be interested in participating in a group with the Charles River Watershed communities to discuss climate resilience and have a forum for discussing regional issues? And there is a right and wrong answer to this one. You could probably tell what we think the right one is. <laughs> so far, so far everyone's answering right. All right, 100% say yes. 100% of the 11 out of 15 have responded and said yes. Awesome. Wonderful. All right, well, we, we, we look forward to signing up for the Climate Compact. We've got it all set up for you. And that concludes uh, the main yep. part of our presentation. We've got it's 7.54, so just a few minutes till eight. And so we do have some time for questions and, and, and comments and suggestions. Um, but just to sum up, our recommendations have to do with specific projects in your community that we're happy to help you with related to the MVP process or not, though obviously the MVP process is an ideal way to do that. Looking at ordinances and bylaws, and we can support you on that. Raising revenue yourselves, um, getting revenue um, through the state or the federal government, and we're happy to help with that. And looking, uh, looking at ways to conserve land in your community and our concert, we can walk you through the conservation tool to help you with that. Um, but there's just many, many actions that you can take that we are we are interested and able to uh, to help to help out with. So with that, let's open it up. Um, if folks want to, you know, we're 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 not a huge group, so if folks wanted to um, unmute and offer a question or a comment, that would be welcome. If you'd rather put it in the chat, that's fine too. Happy to also, if folks have some successes to share that they wanna talk about what they're doing that others could, could learn from. It's hard to keep track of all the great things that local communities are doing. I'll weigh in um, here. My name is Dave Gladstone from Brookline. <clears throat> and I know that our town has undertaken a canopy study and uh, the results are hopefully coming out within the next month or so. That is great. What initiated that? Um, our sustainability and our climate action committee and the town. And, you know, just knowing that we had some flooding along the muddy river and that we have heat islands and that, uh, you know, there's issues with uh, storm drains. That's fabulous. And what do you think the timing will be? Unknown at this time. They're, they're just finishing up the study. Okay. Well, we would love to see that. I know in Newton, that when I've looked at the overlay of um, tree canopy and asphalt, um, you know, there's 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 many parts of the city that um, are already experiencing heat island in the summer, and so that's something that I'd like to see us do more of: is how do we prioritize tree planting and tree protection in those areas? And I know also, and I'm curious if you're experiencing this also, that maintaining trees is a challenge, having the funding to sort of to keep them healthy pruned and so forth. Um, and then sometimes there are complaints from residents that they're worried about trees knocking over power lines or hitting their house as they get you know, older and weaker, sometimes from climate change, maybe not. Um, so I don't know if you hear any of those kinds of concerns in Brookline. Yeah, the, the town budgets monies, A, to replace trees, B, to do trimming. Uh, but there has been discussions about having some type of regulation for trees that are on private property. It's easy for their town to control the trees that are on town property. It's much more difficult and cumbersome to deal with private property. And yet those trees affect all of our health as well, health and safety as well. Agreed. Yes. Thank you, Dave. Anyone else? See. Leo says, your presentation is very timely for us in Rentham. Our CONCOM is studying how to improve our bylaws and regulations. Thank you for the resources you have provided. And Leo, we will, we will follow up with uh, links to the uh, resources that we have provided in the toolkit. So uh, if you need um, help with that, we're, we're here to help. Anyone else? 
Anyone else? I had a I had a quick question. Sure. This is uh, Kobe from Franklin, and hey, Rob, it's uh, great to see you and and hear from you. Um, I I was wondering where we were at last. I checked in. SEMA flood maps were highly outdated and not reflective of uh, climate change. Right, they were all they were all backwards looking uh, and not forwards looking to to future climate change. And and but that's what the MVP uh, process is based on. How concerned are we of that? Is that still an issue? Um, and and is there a, uh, an effort to increase awareness of um, you know uh, how they might be outdated and, and what places might be even more vulnerable than the process uh, currently you know, dictates? That is a great question, Julie. You want to address that? Yes, excellent, Kobe. You set me up. Um, I can talk a little bit. I can talk a minute here on this um, watershed modeling project that we referenced a few times. This is a project that is involving 15 communities to actually build a computer model of the watershed. Um, and by doing that, you can run different rainfall scenarios, um, basically to address the issue you just described, Kobe. The, the FEMA maps just come from past data. It's, it's just what we've experienced basically. Um, and we know that with climate change, we will experience new and extreme storm events that are not part of our historical record. Um, so by having this computer model of the watershed, we can run all sorts of rainfall scenarios and see the impacts all across the watershed. So we'll get an understanding of where riverine flooding is occurring, um, meaning where the river is actually overtopping its banks and possibly spilling out into communities. And then we'll also get an understanding of where stormwater flooding is an issue um, because sometimes our stormwater infrastructure, our pipes underground um, can actually cause, cause flooding impacts if there's a constriction, um, the pipes fill up. They have, a, they have a fixed capacity, so they fill up. So this watershed modeling project is being funded by the MVP Action Grant Program out of the Executive Office of Energy and Environmental Affairs. Um, and we are currently finalizing the model. Um, it's in a software called PC Swim, which is built to do this kind of thing. Um, and running existing condition scenarios and future climate scenarios. And the results will basically be maps of the watershed that show where flooding is happening now and flooding, where flooding is likely to happen in the future. Um, the last thing we'll do as part of that project is to test some nature-based solutions and see what impact they have. Um, so can we store more water upstream and then reduce the impacts of flooding downstream? Um, those are the kind of questions we're trying to answer. Amazing, thank you. It's a little after eight o'clock. Maybe we'll see if anyone else has any burning questions. Uh, hi, this is Becca Solomon from Hopedale. Uh, so I just had a question as we're looking at nature-based solutions. How much is that also having to combat the invasives that are along the area? And not sure about other towns with Hopedale, we have a very large number of invasive plant species, which usually take up the banks of the river, and that prevents putting in stabilizing, stabilizing, sorry, uh, and other, uh, you know, pollutant mitigating plants along that area. So I I'm curious if you guys have done anything with being able to find a way to get rid of the invasives and switch to natural native plants or some other solution that helps to get around that. Yeah, Becca, that's a good question. Um, it is a tough issue. It is a tough issue. Um, we, with our invasives um, program, we typically pick very targeted areas um, and very specific plants where we know we'll have a chance of success. Um, because unfortunately, in some cases, the invasives um, have really just made themselves um, too much at home 
um, and have become kind of too much of the current ecosystem um, that it, it might just be too difficult to get rid of them. We have had a few success stories though. Water chestnut, um, which is an in-river invasive. Um, we've been on, I don't know, probably a 15 year effort um, to try and remove that one. And it really does take consistent removal of the plant over 15 years. Um, and, and as you say, in cases, in many cases, um, also replanting of natives and maintaining those natives. Um, so it is um, doable, uh, but it definitely does take some planning and a willingness to commit resources over many years. Um, but we do have a fairly extensive program, so we'd be happy to talk more about our experiences. And DCR does offer some funding um, to help with this. Awesome. One other thing. Oh, I got I was saying thank you. So go ahead. Oh, I, I've seen it not in my role as CRWA, but in my own town, hometown of Braintree. I've seen when they've permitted some projects along a river, they've actually worked with the property owner to remove and do some restoration of the bank and um, for planting native species. So I've seen that happen too in, during the uh, conservation approval process. Awesome. Thank you. Well, great. Well, thank you all so much for joining. Uh, we will share the recording and the slides and the resources. And uh, you are now forewarned that anyone who's not part of the Climate Compact, we are excited to welcome you and we will be following up and um, really, really look forward to working with you to build climate resilience and improve the Charles River further. So thank you. Good night.